I want to welcome everybody to our Friday Fundamentals webinar number six. This is Operational Measures That Tie It All Together. So we are going to talk about operational measures, and uh, we're going to refer back to a lot of the things that we've talked about in earlier sessions. So my name is Philip Blackerby with Blackerby Associates. I'm a consultant with ADOT's Business Engagement and Compliance Office and have been for several years now. I've worked with lots and lots of DBEs, mostly on financial management, strategic planning, marketing, all kinds of different ideas. I've trained over 800 entrepreneurs, mostly in the greater Phoenix area in the last 11 years uh, with my partners. I have a master's degree from the University of Texas and a bachelor's degree from Brown University. I do want to remind everybody about the Financial Services Handbook that's available free. It's a free download in English and Spanish. Uh, there are the links on the screen, uh, HTTP bit.ly forward slash capital F I N capital S V C S. That's the easiest way to get to it. The uh, full link is also provided there. But this handbook is about a 20 page document that covers financing, all kinds of financing options, insurance, different kinds of insurance, bonding. Um, and uh, I urge all DBEs to take a look at that financial services handbook. Now, what if you knew which metrics were the most appropriate for your business? What if you knew what was important and were able to distinguish what was important from what was not important? What if everyone in your organization rode in the same direction? What if you could measure and chart your progress weekly, monthly, or even yearly? Would that be valuable to you? If so, this is the right place to be. And uh, I welcome everybody to the program. So what should you measure in these operational measures? That's a big question. And I'm an economist, and so like all economists, the answer is that depends, in this case, on what you want to accomplish. So we're going to talk first about what it is you want to accomplish. And then we'll go on to other issues. So first we want to talk about a SWOT analysis. I'm sure all of you have seen this before. A SWOT analysis is strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And let's look at these individually. So strengths and weaknesses, um, those are internal to your organization. And they're in the present time. So. Uh, when you have weaknesses, you want to find ways to compensate for those weaknesses, to mitigate them, to partner and work around them. And you want to use your strengths to exploit opportunities. When we look at external and future issues, those include the opportunities and threats. So uh, those are all external to your organization, and they're not really necessarily in the present. They may be. Uh, but if they're threats, they're in the future. So the idea is to move yourself from all the other cells up to the upper right, where strengths and opportunities meet. So if you have weaknesses, work around them, compensate, mitigate, partner, do whatever you can. Um, if you have threats, you want to recognize and avoid those threats and compensate for your weaknesses. Uh, if those threats of affect your strengths and recognize, overcome, and convert those threats into opportunities so that ultimately you can use those strengths to exploit your opportunities. So as they come up, uh, take advantage of those opportunities. So we always want to move toward uh, opportunities and strengths and away from weaknesses and threats. And so as you set your plans, we find ways to do that. So when we talk about planning and strategic planning, uh, we need to recognize that there are four levels, strategic, tactical, operational, and activity levels. And we're going to talk mostly about the strategic and tactical levels, but let's look briefly at what they are. So strategic level of planning includes mission, vision, values, goals, strategic objectives. And it's about results or outcomes that you want to, want to achieve. Those results or outcomes are usually, again, external to your organization. So they usually in terms of, of your customers, your clients, um, people that you want to affect. 
tactical uh, level of planning describes how you're going to achieve the strategic level of planning. So it includes tactical objectives, production targets, product development, those sorts of things. It's about products and outputs, not about results and outcomes. Those are strategic concerns. Tactical concerns are about products and outputs. At lower levels, there's operational level of planning, which is about processes instead of products or outcomes. And there you have operational objectives, process controls. You're concerned about throughput rates. And then at the bottom, you really have individual employees are planning their own day or their own week at the activity level. This is about tasks and steps. So you've got job descriptions, policies, procedures, to-do lists. All of those kinds of things make up the activity level of planning. And the idea is that all four of these levels of planning integrate, that they all depend on each other. So let's look briefly uh, then at the strategic level uh, where we have goals and objectives. So the number one kind of goal uh, is uh, there are different kinds of goals, is what they call a BHAG. And a BHAG stands for Big, Hairy, Audacious Goal. For example, um, Nike's goal was to crush Adidas back in the uh, 1970s. And they pretty much did that. It took them a while. Adidas has tried to make a comeback, but pretty much they, they crushed them. Stanford University had a goal back in the 1940s, which was to become the Harvard of the West. That was their BHAG. And I think everybody would pretty much agree that they've achieved that. Uh, one of the most famous BHAGs was John F. Kennedy's challenge in 1961. Before the end of the current decade, we will send a man to the moon and return him safely to Earth. Uh, engineers told him that couldn't be done, but he said, that's all right, we're going to set that as a goal anyway. And of course, they did achieve it before the end of the decade. It was 1969. I've always thought the most important part of that uh, goal was the second half, which was to bring him back to Earth. Another kind of goal involves an exit strategy. We should all think about how are we going to get out of this business uh, once we get into it. So different kinds of exit strategies could be you're going to leave your business to your children, you're going to sell the business or merge it with some other company. Um, those of you who really have <coughs> growth-oriented startups might think about an IPO, an initial public offering. <coughs> a lot of other companies look at an ESOP, which is an employee stock option plan, and that's a way to basically sell the business to the employees. Some unfortunate people that don't really put their exit strategy in their strategic plan in place can run dry or just liquidate the business when they want to re retire. So when we think about this, we also want to think about, do we want a company or do we want a business? And I like to distinguish those. To me, a company is something that can make money without necessarily having the principal involved on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you have a company, you can indeed take a vacation, spend a couple of weeks in Aruba sitting on the beach or skiing in, in Colorado. Uh, and your company will still make money for you, as opposed to a business, which really requires the daily uh, involvement of the principal in everything that goes on day to day. I've chosen to have a business. My business depends on me being involved. If I don't work, I don't make any money. And that's a reasonable choice for some people. Other people make a choice to have a company, that that company will make money even if the principles not on site every day, all day. So think about whether you have a company or a business and whether you want a company or a business. Look at this goals matrix here. This is pretty simple. So you got two questions. Do we have it and do we want it? And here we want to achieve uh, the preserve level. So if we've got it and we want to keep it, then uh, we need to preserve it. Uh, if we got it, um, if, but we don't want it, then we need to eliminate it. 
if we don't have it but we want it, we want to achieve it, that's the green square. And if we don't have it and we do we don't want it, then we need to avoid it. Pretty straightforward. Think about goals versus objectives. So in in the world of Blackerby Associates, a goal uh, indicates the direction of change. That is, how do you want your business to change over time? It doesn't necessarily have a target. It doesn't necessarily have a time frame. But it does indicate which direction you want to change your business. An objective, on the other hand, we're going to talk about this in a second, should be a smart objective. And at the strategic level, those objectives should address what are the results or outcomes that you want your company to achieve. So let's look at these SMART objectives. So they are specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and time-bound. Now, you may talk to some other consultants, and they may have slightly different words for some of these uh, acronyms for SMART, uh, but they're wrong, and this is the right Number, these are the right words to uh, describe it. So specific, uh, you can read that objective and you know exactly what it is that's supposed to be achieved. It's measurable. You know when it has been achieved because you can measure the level of achievement. It's actionable. So people look at that and they know, now I know what to do in order to achieve that objective. It's realistic. It may be a reach, uh, but uh, nothing wrong with the reach goal, but it is something that can be achieved. And it's time bound. There is some limit on how much time you get to achieve that goal Let's, or that objective. Let's look at a couple of, of uh, examples here. So uh, one example might be to increase the company's equity to $750,000 by the end of 2015. And so that is specific. We know exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about equity on the balance sheet. It's measurable. We're going to increase it to 750,000. If it goes to 749,000, we have not met our objective. It's actionable. Um, people in the company know how to increase the equity. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, it's realistic. Um, we don't know exactly what the current level of equity is, but we believe that we can achieve $750,000 by the end of 2015, and it is time bound end of 2015. Another uh, smart objective might be to serve 100 new monthly subscription customers. Again, specific, it's new monthly subscription customers. That's what we're talking about. Measurable, it's 100. Any less than that doesn't achieve the objective. More than that beats the objective. It's actionable, it's realistic, and it's time bound, 1231. So those are smart objectives. Now, if we look, if you're not into pyramids, uh, like in the earlier slide, uh, here's a different way of looking at it. So the green is the mission, vision, values, goals, and strategic objectives. Um, the red is the tactical level of, plan, of planning, which is tactical objectives, production plans, and production product development. The blue is the operating objectives, um, the uh, operational level of planning, process control. It's about process and throughput. And then individual employees are at the activity level, so policies, procedures, job descriptions, and to-do lists. And you can see how these are linked. So the strategic level describes mission, vision, values, goals, objectives, outcomes, and results. But how do you achieve those outcomes and results? Well, you achieve them by achieving your tactical objectives by implementing your production plan, by creating new products. Well, how do we do that? Well, we do that by um, achieving our operating objectives, implementing process controls, managing throughput. How do we do that? Well, we set policies, procedures, we have job descriptions, and individual employees have to-do lists. And looked at another way, individual employees say, well, why do I have to have a job description and a to-do list? And the reason why you have to have that is so that you can achieve the operating objectives, the operating level of planning. Why do we have to achieve those operating objectives? Because that will lead us to achieving the tactical level of planning, the tactical objectives. And why are those tactical objectives important? Because that's how we can achieve our strategic objectives, our goals, 
implement our values, achieve our mission, and our vision. It's just a different way of looking at the same pyramid. Coming back to our pyramid, here's an example for one company. So the strategic level, their primary goal or a strategic objective in this case, is to increase the company value to $10 million in five years. How are they going to do that? They're going to sell $3.5 million per year by 2015. How are they going to sell $3.5 million? They're going to create and introduce two new services per year and develop relationships with 1,500 customers. Well, how are they going to develop relationships with 1,500 customers? Well, they're going to manage their presence in major social network, and they're going to meet with 40 customers every week. And that may be phone calls or luncheons or whatever, but if they meet with 40 customers a week, then that will lead them to develop relationships with, with 1,500 customers. So why do they meet, have to meet with 40 customers a week? In order to develop relationships with 1,500 customers. Why is that important? Because that's going to help them sell $3.5 million per year. And why do they need to sell $3.5 million per year? so that they can increase the company value to $10 million in five years. Let's look at another example. This might be an engineering firm that wants to grow, and they've decided at the strategic level that the way they're going to grow is to create a one-stop construction services firm. Not just engineering, but all kinds of construction services. How are they going to do that? Well, this year they're going to add land surveying services. Uh, they're also going to start adding construction management services. So not just engineering, but now also land surveying and construction management. How are they going to do this? Well, first they've got to recruit a registered land surveyor and a crew. They've got to order surveying equipment so they can get their surveying function up to snuff. Uh, then they're going to start having lunch with uh, the prime contractor pre-construction managers. Uh, and they've got to get that... Uh, uh, equipment ordered, so how they do that is they send the specifications to different vendors, get bids. Why do they have to send those specifications out? Well, so they can order the surveying equipment. Why do they need to order the surveying equipment? Because they're trying to add land surveying services to their menu of services. And why is that important? Because that contributes to achieving their strategic objective to grow as a one-stop construction services firm. So you can go down the pyramid or up the pyramid, depending on which question you ask. If you're asking how are we going to do this, then you're moving down the pyramid. If you're asking why in the world are we doing this, then you're going up the pyramid. So what should we measure? Come back to that question. That's a basic question. There are several things that we can think about, and we've covered these in the earlier webinars. So financial performance, we talked about that in, uh, in March. Break-even point, cash flows, we talked about that in April. Credit worthiness, we talked about that in May. Marketing effectiveness, we talked about that in June. Prime contractor relationships, we talked about that in July. And now we're talking about strategic planning. So we're trying to tie all of these issues together as we go along. So look at our balance sheet here. This is about our financial performance. And we might set, for example, uh, some objectives related to our accounts receivable. That's one of the key things that prevents a lot of companies from achieving their financial goals and maintaining liquidity and keeping cash. Remember, cash is king and don't run out of money. Kick, drew, cash is king, don't run out of money. And managing the accounts receivable is a key element of that. Or uh, we might look at our plant and equipment. I think it's uh, been clear that during the recession, the Great Recession, a lot of companies uh, did not continue to invest in plant and equipment. They accumulated more and more depreciation, and that really hurt their position because now they really can't borrow against that plant and equipment because it's not worth anything. It's become obsolete or it's worn out and they can't buy new, so it really hurt them. It's important to continue to invest in plant equipment as you go through the process. 
Uh, you can also look at short-term debts. These are typically, in most businesses today, credit cards or line of credit. And so setting some measurements around short-term debts, if that's an issue for your company, that would be something to pay attention to. We can also look on the P&L, on the income statement side, and focus on a couple of issues. Certainly gross sales. Uh, that's what drives a lot of companies. More companies fail because they lack customers than because they lack products. So uh, gross sales is something you might want to set a target uh, about. Or you might look at your cost of goods sold or your cost of services sold. Uh, if you can reduce those, that will improve your gross profit margin. And if you can improve your gross profit margin, um, then you will improve your overall profitability. Another area to look at is all of your fixed expenses, your so-called fixed expenses, SG&A, selling, general, and administrative expenses. Anything you can do to manage those expenses, to reduce them, to use them more efficiently, can help you to um, reduce your or improve your operating margin and improve your operating profit. So those are just a couple of ideas, but the important thing is it depends on the condition of your business. It depends on what you are trying to achieve in your strategic plan, in your strategic objectives, in your goals and strategic objectives, and in your tactical objectives. Another thing you might want to look at is your, is your um, break-even point. And this is the description that we've had of break-even point and how you calculate that break-even point. It's where your sales uh, meets your variable plus fixed costs. And there's a formula for calculating your break-even point. We talked about this um, several months ago. I think it was April. So take a look at your break-even point. If that's an issue for you, then you may want to measure your break-even point on a regular basis. Um, if you really need some financing, then you might look to clean up your financials. So cash is king and don't run out of money. So look at your cash balances in your business. Manage your accounts payable. Manage your uh, accounts receivable. So pay your bills on time and collect your invoices on time. Minimize your overhead. That's your fixed cost. Allocate direct costs to contracts so that you're getting uh, reimbursed for your direct costs fully. Include all the costs in your equipment rates. If you are a professional services firm, you need to get audited overhead rates if you're large enough. And having good, strong, well-documented overhead rates, uh, even if they're not audited, is a good way to defend your rates that you charge. Remember that professional services is not so much about uh, price competition as it is about uh, qualifications. So if you have good qualifications, then you need to make sure you're recovering your costs and you have a good uh, overhead rate. And manage projects for faster finish. The quicker you finish a product project and get paid for it, the less overhead that project has to cover. So that's an important way to improve your profitability. So look at this list of things and see if there's anything that is problematic for your company. And if it is problematic, then Go ahead and, and, and uh, measure that. Measure what's important. <clears throat> if you think financing is an issue for you in the future, if you think you need to have financing for a good uh, business reason, then here are the things that banks want to have from you. And so looking at all of these elements of a loan application, um, what are the things that you need to deal with? You need to make sure that you uh, have clean ownership records, that your business licenses are all up to date. Um, you need to look at your tax returns for three years, uh, resumes for all the owners. Um, look at your P&Ls. Look at your uh, projections. Um, make sure you have a clearly written explanation of how your business works and what it's all about. Uh, it could be that marketing is an issue, and so these are the steps to effective marketing that we talked about. Um, I think that was in June. Uh, customers and clients, products and services, messages, and then media. So 
So you attack each of these in order. Start with your customers. What are the benefits that your customers are looking to achieve? What are their needs, wants, and expectations? Then develop products and services that meet your customers' needs. Then create messages that will resonate with your customers. And only then select media that will communicate a message about your products and services that will resonate with your customers where they are. So if marketing is an issue for you, then look at it. We remember that uh, John Wanamaker is supposed to have said, half the money I've spent on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. So cheap ways of doing uh, marketing is public relations, where you have editorial content. So other people telling about you rather than you telling about yourself. Typically, editorial content is stories in a newspaper or trade magazines that focus on your clients and your customers. How did their success improve, uh, and how did you contribute to achieving their success? But it's about the customers and clients. And then, of course, social media, uh, where you get to develop an intimate relationship with customers and clients on a mass scale. Social media marketing has lots of different approaches. Uh, usually, a foundation is a website. I was surprised to see uh, one of our DBEs um, doesn't have a website. Uh, these days, that's really a basic requirement of anybody in business. Uh, you don't necessarily need to spend a lot of time and effort in maintaining that website, but it's cheap enough to put one together and easy enough to put one together. You don't need technical skills. Do a WordPress website and get it hosted at some place like GoDaddy for $25 a year. It's not an expensive or difficult approach. Um, you can blog. If you are a writer, then blogging could be a good thing. If you are not a writer, um, it's kind of like teaching a pig to sing. Right? It will uh, annoy the pig and probably won't work. So if you're not a good writer or you don't enjoy writing, then I don't recommend you do a blog. But if you are a writer, then putting together a blog and updating it once a week that is a really good idea. You can also go to other people's blogs and put in your comments. You can, if you're not a writer, you can create a photo blog. Just take a picture and post it on your blog post on your blog site every week or more often if you want. You can create a video blog. Um, so video is the new is the new way of communicating. That's very easy. Um, Commercial social media sites like Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+, uh, those are all valuable. Uh, post what you're doing. Maintain contact. Uh, keep in front of people on a regular basis. Pay attention to Yelp and uh, Angie's List for customer review. Listen to what people are saying about you. If they point out a problem, then respond to that problem. Fix it. Talk to that customer. Find out what's going on. And Twitter, listen, find out what people are saying about you and, and uh, keep up with them. Prime contractor relationships, of course, is all about performance success. And if, if prime contractor relationships is one of your problems, then let's figure out a way to measure your performance success, bidding success, dealing with the scope of work, getting on their bidding systems, filling out pre-qualification forms, and developing those relationships. Uh, ultimately, that's what it's all about. So if that's a problem, then you can measure different levels, different aspects of your prime contractor relationship. How well, how good are you at developing those relationships? How many pre-qualification forms have you put out? How many bidding systems are you on? Uh, how many times have you reviewed the scope of work for a project? Uh, what's your success rate in bidding on those projects? And ultimately, what's your success rate in performing against those projects? Now, those of you who uh, remember our marketing session uh, will, might remember Bob's Landscaping, our fictional company. So let's talk about some examples of how Bob's Landscaping uh, might do its strategic planning. So it's fairly simple. Uh, he's got a long-term plan, which is to reduce each cruise break-even point by 5%. Uh, that should have, um, that's a goal because it's not time bound, so it's not a very good objective, uh, but it is a good goal. 
He wants to increase his credit rating to 730, again, a goal. He wants to grow his residential business so that he eventually has four crews working instead of just the two that he has today. And he wants to run four major commercial projects per year with a fifth crew. So those are pretty, um, pretty aggressive and ambitious goals. Not necessarily a BHAG, but pretty aggressive and pretty audacious in their own right. So that's his long-term plan. That's his strategic level plan. Now, how is he going to achieve that is through a middle-term plan. This is really more of a tactical plan. So he needs to cut his overhead by 5% by the end of the year. There's a time-bound objective. Manages cash flow monitoring sheet weekly. We talked about cash flow monitoring and how we can do that, um, I think, in the second webinar in April. Um, so manage that cash flow weekly. He's going to increase his customer satisfaction rate from 86% to 92%. Um, again, a measurable goal. Uh, doesn't necessarily have a time frame there. He should have that. but. Uh, he needs to increase that customer satisfaction rate. He needs to grow his business, support a third crew. So his goal is to get to four crews. Uh, but by this year, he's going to try to get to the third crew. He's going to publish 12 monthly newsletters every year. He's going to get on five more prime business systems by the end of the year. And how is he going to achieve this middle-term plan? Well. He has a short-term plan. Every week he has a new plan. So this week, next week, he's going to collect half of his 30-day receivables. He's going to mow 80 lawns. He's going to submit a Highway 303 proposal to Sun, FNF, and Kiwit, all big prime contractors. And he's going to meet with his banker and start talking about an SBA loan. So these are all different kinds of, of uh, operational objectives that he's going to meet in the short run that will help him achieve his tactical objectives in the middle term and achieve his long-term goals and objectives as well. So let's look at how all of these things correspond with each other. So in the long term, he wants to reduce his break-even point. So in order to do that, he's going to cut his overhead in the middle term. And in the short term, he's going to collect those receivables. All of those will help him reduce his break-even point. He wants to increase his credit rating. So one of the things he has to do to that is to manage his cash flows on a weekly basis. And in the short term, he's going to meet with his banker and, and talk about how he can get his credit rating improved and how he can um, do a better job of managing his business. He said he wanted to grow his residential service to four crews. So in order to do that, he's going to increase customer satisfaction from, what, 86 to 92 uh, percent. That will help him get more testimonials and whatnot. Um, he wants to grow to a third crew, and he wants to mail out 12 newsletters. That's part of his marketing effort to get his name out in front of customers on a regular basis. In the short term, he's got to mow 80 lawns this week. He also wants to work four commercial projects every year. So uh, he's got to get on five primes mid systems. Uh, that's his middle term objective. And in the short term, he's going to submit a proposal for that Highway 303 construction project. So you know, he's addressing all of his long term goals with middle term objectives and short term objectives. If he can achieve those short term objectives, that will contribute to achieving his middle term objectives. Achieving his middle-term objectives will help him achieve his long-term goals and objectives. So it all integrates all together. Bob's even got a dashboard. So he looks at his, uh, his short-term objectives and says, week to week, how am I doing? Lawn's mud, well, it's up and down. In all of these cases, the red is his actual performance. Uh, the green is his target performance. So in terms of lawn mode, Long's mode, he's sort of hanging in there, but it varies pretty much week to week. It looks like there was rain back in uh, June and in middle of July, 
Uh, and of course, when it rains, you can't mow lawn, so uh, that really cuts down on his ability to serve his clients. Uh, but then he bounces back the next week with even more lawns. So it kind of varies, but he's by and large sometimes achieves his target, sometimes not, but deal with it as, as it works out. Uh, his customer subscriptions are growing ever so slowly. So this tells him maybe we need to really focus. The trend is good, but you know we're really a long way from our goal. So we may need to step up some action here. His accounts receivable, that's also kind of uh, leveled off. He did make some progress a couple of, uh, a month ago or two months ago, but that's kind of leveled off and maybe even gotten a little worse. Meanwhile, his target is actually to improve his uh, receivables even more um, this month. So that's why he set a short-term goal. Of, Let's collect half of those receivables this week. Let's jump on these people. And there's no reason why they're not paying their bills. Let's go collect. And our customer satisfaction is kind of jumping around a bit, uh, but the trend seems to be pretty good. So he's moving toward his goal, sometimes exceeds it, but as a general rule, he's still below his goal, but the trend is good. So keep monitoring that customer satisfaction. He must measure that every week. So this is one example of, of how you can me measure and manage, but it depends on what is important to you. In Bob's case, He's got to keep up with how many lawns are we mowing and how, what kind of customer satisfaction does that generate. He's got to grow his business so more subscriptions is what he needs. And he's got to improve his cash position. So work on those 30-day accounts receivable. Make it work. That's what's important to Bob. And so that's what he measures. Now, when you start to achieve an objective, so lawns mode, for example, He's pretty much achieving his objectives, uh, not every week, but pretty much most of the time. He's hovering right around there. Um, and so maybe that's less of a problem for him, and he might want to drop that measure and add a new one, change his dashboard. Just because you start measuring something does not mean you need to continue to measure it all the time. Once you start achieving your goals in a certain area, then you really shift into maintenance mode and you can uh, drop that as a measure. It becomes less important to you. And you can find some other way of improving your business uh, that is more important to you. So just because you measure something once doesn't mean you have to continue to measure it on a regular basis. Once you start achieving your objectives, drop it and focus on something else. Now I have one more thought here, which is, this is our pyramid from before, strategic, tactical, operational, and activity level planning. But think about it for a moment. What if we turn that upside down? In that case, customers are at the top. Line workers then serve those customers. So the most important people in the organization are the line workers who serve customers. Um, customers are the most important element of your business, and so you need to focus on the line workers. So what do supervisors do? Well, their job is to support the line workers, facilitate their work, so that the line workers can more easily serve the customers. Customers are the focus here. What do the managers do then? Well, the managers support and facilitate the line workers, the supervisors, and the customers. So their job is not to manage so much as to support and facilitate, just like the supervisors. They really don't need to manage well-trained line workers. Those line workers know what to do. They have policies and procedures, and they follow them. All they need is somebody to support them and to facilitate. That is to make their job easier. And executives, of course, uh, support and facilitate the line workers, managers, supervisors, and the customers. So the executives at the bottom are really holding up the whole organization. And if they need to look at their job as a support function, not necessarily as a management function, but as a support function. 
And in this kind of an organization, everyone in the company either directly supports customers or supports people that do support customers. So you can look at your strategic planning effort not only as a way to organize your strategic plan, your tactical plan, your operational plan, and your activity level plans, but you can also use it to think about how to manage your organization. While we're talking about that, I want to remind everybody about the Financial Services Handbook, uh, Financing, Insurance, Bonding, English and Spanish, free download. It's online. Go get it. Read it. Download it. Um, what's next? We will have an evaluation survey, so look for emails. Uh, we should put those out this afternoon, and you'll get emails on a regular basis until you come in and and uh, and fill out our little Survey Monkey survey addressing this. Um, Patty, uh, tell us, thank you. This is a good reminder for setting my 13-week goals and all the action items I need to plan out. So. In Patty's organization, she sets 13-week goals. That would be quarterly. And um, setting quarterly goals is a good idea because they become really actionable. <clears throat> People can see this is something we can achieve in the time we have available. Mariana asks, do you have a recommendation for software application for performance measurement? You know. Um, I think there isn't really a single software application that you can do. Um, I created those uh, uh, graphs for Bob's landscaping using a very simple Excel spreadsheet. So, uh, and you need to collect data from a variety of sources. So your QuickBooks can generate graphs and generate information about your financial condition, but it won't tell you for example, how many customers you served last week necessarily, or how many customers you have on your books, or how many um, how many phone calls your marketing people made, or whatever. So those are, you know, you have to draw. Uh, it doesn't tell you about your software, uh, your your social media marketing. So you have to draw measures from all kinds of different sources. And as you draw those measures from different sources, it's really easy to put them into a, a spreadsheet and see how that works. Maybe we can get the spreadsheet uh, to show here. There's the dashboard. Here's the data. So just a couple of tables here. So customer subscriptions by week, 30-day accounts receivable by week, lawns mowed by week, customer satisfaction by week. It's pretty easy just to set those up in uh, in spreadsheets and create little graphs for them. And this is the dashboard that you can look at on a regular basis. So for software, you know, keep it simple. This is not rocket science. It doesn't need to be rocket science. Uh, let's just keep it uh, keep it easy to do. Any other questions? I want to uh, direct you to the videos. We will post the videos. Uh, as soon as we can, on again, it's a little bit.ly link there, Blackerby TV. Um, if you want to see all the previous ones, uh, Mike says, uh, thanks for providing case example of Bob's landscaping, show dynamics of implementing the concepts. Can you tell me more about business employee structure? Um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean. So there are really kind of two different kinds of employees. There are payroll or W-2 kinds of employees, and there are contractors um, who would get a 1099 at the end of the year. So um, there are IRS tests, though, that will uh, distinguish between who is an employee on the payroll versus who is a contractor. It's like a 12-point test, and you have to meet all of those 12 points. But if the contractor uh, has other clients and the contractor uses his or her own equipment, they have control over the time, you just say, these are the results I want to achieve, 
then they really are contractors. Otherwise, um, they really can be uh, called employees, and then you need to pay payroll taxes for them. So it's important to make sure you have a clean and clear distinction between who is an employee and who is a contractor. Um, then there are different ways of organizing people. So uh, what we find is that putting people into teams is real important. Um, even in my project, uh, in my work, while I'm a sole practitioner, I have lots of team members that are subcontractors or friends that I bring in. I very rarely do a project all by myself. Uh, just this week, we worked with one of the DBEs on their um, server had some problems, and so I teamed up with a server specialist, and she fixed the problem uh, very quickly. Uh, I was just there kind of monitoring and working on their website a little bit, but um, you know, it was really the subcontractor who achieved the results that the customer was looking for. So um, different ways of organizing, that's what works. I want to point out uh, Bob's business and employees, is Bob a partner or a corp? You know, it doesn't really matter whether it's a partnership or a corporation or an LLC. Um, so there are all those different organizations. Those have to do primarily with two things. One is liability, and the other is uh, taxes. So. Um, if you are concerned about liability, then you should definitely have either a corporation or an LLC because that means that while people can sue your company and take everything that your company has, they can't come after you personally and take your personal assets. So you want to have a corporation or an LLC, a limited liability company, if you have liability concerns. Um, Otherwise, there's really not any problem being a sole practitioner. Um, but if you are a sole practitioner and you get sued, then not only can they take your business assets, but they can take some of your personal assets. There are limits in law on how many of your, how much of your personal assets they can take, uh, but you can lose a lot, put it that way. They can't take your firstborn, but they might be able to take your bank account. So that's the liability concern. From a tax standpoint, sole practitioners have an issue in that they might wind up having to pay what's called self-employment taxes on all of their earnings. A self-employment tax is basically both halves of the Social Security and Medicare. So it's 15.3%. Um, if you are a corporation or an LLC, though, you can set yourself up so that you are an employee of that corporation or of that LLC and pay yourself a salary. You have to pay employment taxes on that salary amount, but you may not have to pay employment taxes on the remainder of the profits that your company makes. Um, so there are some tax concerns there. Um, if you are an LLC, then the company doesn't actually pay any taxes. It, those uh, liabilities devolve down to the owners of the LLC, the members of the LLC. Uh, if you're a corporation, um, it may be that your corporation pays taxes, but if you exercise the S corporation option, then you can have those taxes passed down to the shareholders of the corporation similar to the way that a um, LLC passes those tax liabilities down to the members of the LLC. Now, a partnership is somewhat different. There are really two kinds of partnerships. There is a general partnership, and there is a limited partnership. Uh, if you don't file some papers with the Corporation Commission about your limited partnership, then by default, it's a general partnership. And like a sole proprietorship, general partners are responsible for all of the debts and liabilities of the partnership. So even though you may only be a 50% partner, 
you are responsible for 100% of all the debts and liabilities of the partnership um, if it's a general partnership. If it's a limited liability partnership, then you can apportion the liability for uh, debts or other issues um, according to the percentage ownership. So if you are a one-third owner in a three-person partnership, then you and it's a limited partnership and you are a limited partner, then you are only responsible for one-third of the liabilities or debts of that partnership. So all this business uh, structure issue is really about liability and about taxes. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a, an accountant and I recommend that you consult a lawyer of your choice and a certified public accountant of your choice. I hope that addresses your concerns, Mike, and thank you for raising that question. I uh, actually have a complete presentation on that issue. Maybe we can do that in a future webinar. Kent, what do you think? Uh, we have been talking about a new webinar on September 5, so um, that's a tentative date. Look for your newsletter from uh, Kent that will give you the specifics when it comes out. The focus of this one will be on the Arizona Innovation Accelerator Fund that the uh, Commerce Department, the Arizona Commerce Authority, has recently done. I would remind everybody that we do have um, three hours of free consulting available to DBEs. Um, we've started to have several DBEs respond to that. We're addressing uh, website issues. We're addressing ser server issues. We're addressing uh, overhead rate issues. Um, we're addressing uh, WordPress website issues. So all kinds of things going on. We're going to talk uh, to one of our DBEs about how to hire salespeople. So we've got lots of different things involved here, lots of different issues. If uh, I can't solve the issue, we'll bring in somebody who can. We could, for example, facilitate you to develop your strategic plan during those three hours. I've done that several times. So feel free to call on us. You are not alone. You can get help regardless of what it is. Help with filling out a loan application uh, with a bank. Uh, help dealing with the uh, pre-qualification form for a prime contractor. All of those things we can help you with if you need to help. So. Um, so please uh, you know, feel free to request those resources. Kent says we can further discuss additional webinars. So if you have ideas about other future webinars, please uh, send Kent an email. Copy me if you want. Um, but uh, I think these are a fun and easy way to get some training across. So any other questions? We still do have a few more minutes. I want to recognize uh, Ronnie Baker. Thank you, Ronnie. You are the only person that has perfect attendance at all six of these webinars. So congratulations for you. Uh, and those of you who uh, know Ronnie um, or don't know Ronnie, you should think about it. She is a manufacturer's representative and broker of specialty building products. So if you need specialty building products, uh, here's somebody who has tremendous amount of tenacity and stick to it and uh, has attended all six of these webinars. Thank you, Ronnie. Congratulations. Uh, anybody else have any questions? So I don't hear any. So let me thank everybody for attending this program. Uh, it's been very exciting for me. Watch for future news and uh, uh, collect on your three free hours of uh, consulting for DBEs. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again next month. Thank you very much.